The next item of business is debate on motion 16445 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on land reform in Scotland, delivering for now and the future. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Rosanna Cunningham to speak to and move the motion for up to 12 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Land reform is a subject that has been relevant to Scotland for several hundred years. Uh, and I have to say it sometimes seems that I have been talking about it for several hundred years. However, the pace of change has been stepped up since the inception of this parliament. We have legislated to enable communities to buy land, to establish the Scottish Land Commission, to require ministers to set out their vision for land reform through the Scottish Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement, which was published in September 2017, the very first of its kind anywhere in the world. It sets out a vision of a strong and dynamic relationship between Scotland's land and its people, where all land contributes to a modern and successful country and where land rights and responsibilities are recognised and fulfilled. In the foreword to the statement, I said that Scotland's land is one of our most valuable assets, and that remains true. Our land is at the heart of our environment, and it makes an important contribution to our economy in countless ways. It supports the lives we lead, whether through housing, recreation, the production of food, or any one of a myriad other ways. Land is vital to Scotland's inclusive and sustainable economic growth and to social justice. Despite this, our relationship with land is unbalanced and has been for hundreds of years. Too much of our land is still owned by too few people. Too much of our land in both rural and urban areas is unproductive, and too few of us are able to influence decisions about the use and management of land. And addressing these issues is at the core of the Scottish Government's land reform agenda. I know that some people think that the statement is not strong enough, while others think it goes too far. I believe that the statement is an ambitious encapsulation of land reform. It is right that we challenge landowners to take their responsibilities seriously, and it is right that we expect good practice from everyone who makes decisions about land. I am determined that the land reform agenda will bring about real change that tackles deep-seated problems and finally allows everyone to benefit from Scotland's land. The land rights and responsibilities statement will be at the core of our approach. Community ownership has long been a prime focus for reformers and the Scottish Government continues to support communities to take ownership of land and assets. There are three forms of community right to buy already in force and a fourth is being developed. There is a healthy queue of communities who are seeking to acquire land and assets for the long-term benefit of the community. And the Scottish Land Fund provides £10 million per year to support communities and is an important part of the community ownership landscape. Communities don't need to use right-to-buy mechanisms to access the fund, and this year it will invest more than ever before, helping communities take ownership of the land and buildings that matter to them. I recently visited the Pyramid in Anderston, Glasgow, an excellent example of a listed 20th century church uh, to mark the 100th award made by the Scottish Land Fund. The pyramid has long served as a community hub and it has now been bought by the community. And it's significant, I think, that this award was made to a community in an urban area. Community right to buy legislation originally reflected the history of land reform and applied only to rural areas. But as the value of community ownership became increasingly apparent, the Scottish Parliament legislated to extend the community right to buy to communities in urban areas. That the 100th award was made to a community in Glasgow, a mid-20th uh, mid century church, shows just how far I think community ownership has come. Now, applications to the Scottish Land Fund are increasingly for smaller, more discrete projects for specific purposes. These projects, especially in urban areas, may cover only small areas of land, but the contribution they make to the community can be huge. For this reason, as recommended recently by the Scottish Land Commission, we will now seek to measure the growth of community ownership, primarily by the number of communities who own land and assets, rather than the amount of land owned. Historically, the impetus for community ownership has been... Yes, of course. Rhoda Grant. Hi. Um, land ownership is totally unbalanced in Scotland, and if we're moving to, towards the purchase of smaller amounts of land, how are we going to change that 50% of private land ownership in Scotland? Rosanna Cunningham. I, I think if the member uh, listens to what I have to say uh, in the rest of the speech, she will understand the direction uh, of travel. But we want to be able to reflect, uh, reflect the importance of urban community ownership 
uh, in this uh, wider debate uh, as well. Um, I talked about the impetus for community ownership historically being conflict driven and I think that's a fair estimate of how we, how we saw community ownership beginning to develop and that may continue to be a factor particularly in some of the areas that Rhoda Grant is probably thinking about. But I also want to encourage communities to think about land ownership proactively. Uh, I want them to think about the kind of land and facilities they need and then look for opportunities to acquire them. It should be the norm for communities to own land, not the exception. In November, the Scottish Land Commission has published recommendations to improve processes for community ownership and enable more communities to take advantage of the benefits of uh, uh, community ownership. My officials are working with the Land Commission and other stakeholders to implement those recommendations and I look forward to seeing the results. Community ownership will always be a central goal of land reform, but we must also have to tackle the deeply entrenched issues that affect the way in which Scotland's land is owned, used and managed if we are to achieve our land reform ambitions. There are no easy solutions, but we are starting to address these issues. The scope of issues the Land Commission is considering illustrates the complex and interconnected nature of land in Scotland. For example, the Commission has published discussion papers on land for housing, public interest-led development, human rights, and the acquisition of land by public bodies. It has considered land value tax and land value capture, as well as ways of changing Scotland's long-term patterns of land ownership. It is working to bring vacant and derelict land into productive use. And just yesterday, the Commission published perhaps its most challenging report so far, looking at how we might tackle the patterns of scale and concentration of ownership of land in Scotland. The pattern of land ownership in Scotland is unlike anywhere else. There are complex historical reasons for this, but it is at the very heart of the Scottish Government's land reform agenda. If we do not fundamentally alter these patterns and change the framework that allowed them to develop and exist for so long, our land reform ambitions will ultimately be thwarted. This debate was not initially intended as a discussion about the Land Commission report, the publication of which uh, they brought forward because of this debate. It does, however, inform the debate significantly. The Land Commission has made a number of recommendations to tackle the scale and concentration of ownership and help us to, to diversify land ownership. These include the introduction of a public interest test that would apply to proposed land transactions over a certain size. This would enable the public interest to be considered before such transactions can take place and would help ensure that the negative effects of scale and particularly concentration of ownership were kept in check. The Land Commission has steered clear of recommending a blanket ban on people owning particular amounts of land or of specific residency requirements, instead offering this public interest test as a way to improve, uh, uh, to provide important flexibility. And this would certainly be a powerful tool to help stop and reverse the kind of ownership patterns that have hampered Scotland for so many years, for sure. But there would be a great deal of work required to ensure any such proposal was ECHR compliant. My officials will work with the Land Commission, stakeholders, and other Scottish Government policy areas to consider how the report's recommendations can be turned into workable policy. In the last year or so, the Commission has made recommendations that will allow us to drive forward real change. Some, like the public interest test or the proposed compulsory sale order, would need legislation. Others, however, are about culture change. And my officials and the Land Commission are working together with a wide variety of stakeholders to encourage new approaches to how we use and manage land. Transparency about land ownership remains a key debate. If a community does not know who owns land, it cannot influence, influence how it is used or try to buy it, and landowners cannot be held to account if things go wrong. There can be no excuse for information about any type of land ownership to be obscured in 21st century Scotland. And that is true whether the land is held by an individual who lives in Scotland or by a trust that is based in multiple countries. We are developing a new register that will make it clear who owns land and ultimately controls decisions about land. We have consulted on a first draft of regulations and are considering the responses as we develop the regulations further. Presiding officer, I've outlined some of the key priorities for land reform, including some that we're already trying to address, as well as others that are likely to take uh, a little longer before we see tangible change. But it is clear that if we are to deliver real and meaningful change,
we need to tackle a wide range of intertwined issues. Considerations about land rarely exist in isolation. They're almost always connected to other issues, be they economic, cultural, environmental, or social. And this adds to the complexity of our challenge, but it also underlines the fundamental importance of land to Scotland's future. Improving our relationship with Scotland's land will have positive effects in many other arenas. Now, some of the issues I've mentioned require culture change to break long-established ways of thinking about land. Others will require us to re-engineer the relationship between land and other parts of public policy. So delivering land reform will not be easy and it will not be quick, but it is important and it is absolutely necessary. Land reform is something that this parliament has been supportive of from the very beginning. The bill that became the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003 was one of the first pieces of legislation the Parliament considered and uh, engendered a considerable degree of support uh, across the Chamber. The journey is quite emphatically not over and the support of the Parliament remains crucial if we are to achieve the kind of transformative change I have described. So I call on the Parliament to continue its long-standing support for land reform and presiding officer I move the motion in my name. I now call on Edward Mountain to speak to and move amendment 16445.1 for around eight minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. And before I start, I'd like to refer members to my register of interest and in that I'm a partner in a farming partnership and I also own land. I hope this is going to be an interesting debate and I believe the Scottish Conservatives have and always will play a part, a constructive part, in the role of debates about land reform. But in doing so, we've always been clear. We will support an individual's property rights, whether they own a house, a croft, a farm or a state. It will make no difference to us. We've also been clear in saying that there are elements of land reform that we are happy to see progress. Indeed, we support, and as called for by the Cabinet Secretary, the moves towards transparency when it comes to who owns lands and ownership policy. It's sensible to us that the public should know who owns the land and who manages that land. And we support community empowerment. Indeed, much of the Community Empowerment Act 2015 is based on UK government's legislation, which gave the communities the right to bid, the right to build, and the right to reclaim land. And finally, we support the growing diversity of land ownership, which includes private individuals, businesses, charities, and communities. So there is much that we share in common. But it is disappointing that we find ourselves unable to support the government's motion because we do not believe that land reform is all about who owns what. It's more important with who, what people do with the land that they own. I recognize that land reform is, is a highly emotive subject. And having worked in the countryside for many years, I know this perhaps more th than many others who express informed opinions on this subject from within a political bubble. But I believe that if we are to address many of the issues, we can agree perhaps there is a need to be more dispassionate and address the current issues, not the ones that existed before we started down the route of land reform many years ago in this parliament. And frankly, I'm saddened that the Scottish government and their agencies seem to be obsessing on the issue of ownership above all the other considerations. As I've said before, it's not about who owns what or about how much they own. It's about what they do with the land that matters most. And I think the government and all other parties, including uh, in this House, should remember that. So I'm saddened that the Labour Party also seems to be fixated on who owns what. And their solution put forward in their motion, while presiding officer, is the same one as they put forward every time. Uncosted market intervention. They obviously, uh, Andy, I'm, oh, sorry, Mr. Whiteman, I'm happy, presiding officer, to give way to Mr. Whiteman on that. Andy Whiteman. I thank the member for taking his attention. Mr. Mountain says that we shouldn't obsess over who owns land and it's about how it's used and managed that, that matters. Why then um, is the landed class and indeed the Conservative Party so resistant uh, to any notion of land reform? I mean, if ownership doesn't matter, surely Mr. Mountain, for example, would be happy to hand his land over to me. Edward Mountain. 
Well, I, I, I think that the people that I employ are happy that, that, that I look after my business and manage my business in the way that I work it, so it gives them a job and creates uh, prosperity and taxation benefits to the people of Scotland. So, presiding officer, if I can move on. What I'm disappointed about with the Labour Party is they haven't read the Land Commission's report that the Cabinet Secretary referred to yesterday. Otherwise, they would have understand that their motion would actually not work because the annual land market is very small and thus will not receive, receive and achieve the redistribution that they propose. And we're not proposed to support the Greens Amendment either, as again, it's based on the Scottish Lands Commission into land ownership. And this was only published yesterday. And while we need time to review it, upon first reading, it's fair to say that we have deep reservations about many of the recommendations, which appear to us to be based on unsubstantiated evidence and figures that cannot be checked without a lot more further information being put forward. I'm going to make a bit of time, and, and maybe if there's an opportunity later, I'll let you come back in. Now, I'd like to look at some of the comments, if I may, in that Land Commission's report, as I suspect that many of those speaking in this debate today will be relying on. Let's look at some of the examples, as the report suggests that all the problems in the countryside are due to the actions of landowners, which conveniently appears to be large landowners. One example quotes restrictions on the development due to high rents. Now, as a surveyor, I know rents in town and the country are set by the market. Is it right that landlords with land holdings should charge a lesser rent because they have more assets? I don't think that's an argument that's sustainable. Another example given is the ability of rural business to expand as they didn't own enough land. It appears that neighboring land, the neighboring landowner was at fault because he wouldn't sell them that extra land. Now, this is a problem that all businesses face when they want to expand. And it doesn't matter to me one iota if it's in the countryside or the town, if they don't have the land to expand onto, they have to look for new premises. It's exactly the face and the problems that I have faced as a businessman. And another example is of high fees for a transaction. A landowner is criticized in the report by a community because he is asking for the purchaser to bear the professional costs of a voluntary sale. Now that's the way it works. If somebody approaches you to sell land, that the costs are passed on to the person who wants to buy land. Why should it be different in a rural scenario? Now I'll give an intervention, uh, presiding officer. Julian Martin. It's not the point I was going to make, but um, how, how would Mr. Martin react to the, the other case where a community got Scottish Land Fund money and uh, on based on the market price and the landowner refused to sell, changed their mind because they wanted more? Edward Mountain. Well, I can't actually quote and look at an example without it being substantiated. And that's, that's the problem with this report. And my point to you is, is, is transactions happen. And, you, and uh, I know Ms. Barton will be well aware that people try and buy houses and they put an offer in and they think the offer is going to work and then the offer doesn't work. That happens in the countryside, it happens in the town, it happens in business, it happens everywhere. And if you want to give me an example, I'll certainly look at it and I'll certainly take it up. But... It seems to me that none of the reasons that we've been given in the examples, and I've quoted here, support the premise that landowners should always agree to demands to cover costs, subsidise land sales, and transfer on the basis that they must support everyone who lives on or near the land they occupy. But I think it's what is interesting in the report is it's not just private landowners who are blamed in the report. There are several instances where charitable trusts are blamed. Now, I wonder if this is a valid argument. How many charitable landowners have been challenged for breaching their charitable objectives? Something that's relatively easy to do to go by the, to the charitable ombudsman. I have no, seen no case of it yet. Now, this report goes on to blame landowners also of the way they use their land. Examples of new forestry being detrimental is an interesting point. But I seem to remember it is this government that wants more forestry, and it is d indeed needed if they are to reach their planting targets. So I don't see how landowners can be blamed for creating more forestry if it is what the government's policy it is. Now, so am I, believe, so am I naive enough to believe everything is perfect in the countryside? No, I don't believe it's perfect. 
I believe there will always be tension in rural communities, whether they're surrounded by big landowners or small ones. That's why we support better engagement, but we need to be careful. Most farmers I know are delighted to engage with their neighbours, and what is realist, unrealistic for them to expect is for those neighbours to dictate how farmers farm their land and manage their businesses. Farmers' hands, after all, are guided by planning law, government policy, government regulation, and then fiscal good sense, exactly as it should be. And I look forward, therefore, to meeting the Land Commission to discuss the report and seek more information on their findings and comments. But as it reads to me at the moment, the report has been written to support, in my opinion, predetermined conclusions yeah. that do not reflect uh, anything more than the misconception of some of the members of the Land Commission. Now, presiding officer, I look forward to hearing this debate today, and I hope it will be based on informed comment. What I hope we're not going to hear is heated and divisive arguments of old, and we're going to focus on the good progress that has been made since land reform and land management has been dis discussed in this parliament. We have all agreed that the culture of how land is, should be managed has improved. Now, the Scottish Parliament, over 20 years, there have been 19 acts containing land reform measures, including two land reform acts. Many of the changes brought about by the huge sweep of legislation are still being tested and are still bedding in, but I believe progress is being made. There is clear evidence of good practice where landowners and communities are working together and making it mutual beneficial decisions on how to manage land. By returning to the issue of land reform again, I believe that this Parliament is starting to lose sight of the progress that we made. I urge all parties to move the debate forward and focus on the more pressing issues affecting rural communities and rural business, which do not base themselves on who owns what. Presiding officer, I therefore move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. And I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Andy Wayman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is timely that the Scottish Government has brought forward this motion for debate today, as it allows the opportunity to reflect on what has been achieved in land reform in Scotland. And it also allows us to set out just how much more remains to be done to bring about fundamental change to the inequitable and unjust land ownership pattern Scotland still has. I am proud that it was Scottish Labour that brought forward bills shortly after the creation of this Parliament to open the door to delivering radical changes in how we look at the question of land ownership. One dealt with changes to bring about an end to still lingering feudal powers associated with the land. The other firmly established a law of the right to roam freely and responsibly in Scotland, and then of course also the right to buy. I too welcome the growth of community ownership that has found a new momentum following the passing of Labour's Land Reform Act of 2003, supported by um, the Scottish Government and others in this chamber. But within the movement of greater land uh, owned ownership by communities, um, we've also seen that these communities started to speak more confidently, to reflect their experience of law and how it needed to develop, and arguing for further change in our land laws. The work of the Scottish Land Commission in arguing on behalf of communities should be recognised today. As the Minister has said, there is much to celebrate in what community ownership delivers. There are signs of optimism for a sustainable future in places where at times there seem to be no future. The growth and interest in land and other asset ownership across rural and urban Scotland is moving rapidly. Every acre of land that has come into community ownership is a welcome acre. But at the current rate of progress, in 100 years' time, the vast majority of land in Scotland will still be in the same ownership patterns that have endured for centuries. If you believe in greater social justice and a fairer Scotland, which many, many Scots would claim, then for Labour, you can only succeed in that aim uh, and that with, with sufficient land reform. Can it be socially just that so few own so much land, that so many young people in their own place cannot find land or afford housing, that the whims of the few landowners can limit the economic opportunity for the many, that so many in our urban realm are consigned to live their lives next to vacant or derelict lands with no environmental quality, and that our land markets operate in ways that only the privileged few and the wealthy elite can regularly participate in. Further, that the land uses and environment of vast areas is decided by one or two people, and that community is denied the right to a sustainable future by virtue of the control that others can exercise. For Labour, land reform is about community, 
communities being empowered to take more control over their economic, social and environmental destiny. And it is about what is in the public interest. But for Labour, this is also a fundamental matter of justice, of the balance of power shifting from the few to the many. And the opportunity and wealth that can flow from ownership is one of our most fundamental assets, our land. And this must be shared more equally by its people. Land reform is one of the means to the wider and radical redistribution of wealth and power that Labour wants to see. It is a sad truth that as matters stand, this land reform minister or any land reform minister has no powers to formally ask the question of whether our current land arrangements act in the public interest. Communities who want to own land have to show that their interest in the land will serve the public interest that they ha and they have to gain the consent of the people in their community by democratic means that land should be owned by the community. In the way Scotland's land markets work now, private owners simply have to have a big enough checkbook, frankly, and one man is in the process of becoming Scotland's largest landowner, buying up estate after estate in the Highlands. In this, as in so much else, Scotland's landlords fall far short still of what other nations, as the Cabinet Secretary highlighted, can do through long-established intervention powers to look, up, look after the public interest in land questions. And land justice is part of delivering social justice. There should, there should be limits to how much land can be owned by any one person, a difficult issue, but Scottish Labour supports this, and other ownership arrangements, unless it is shown to work in the public interest and for the common good. Many of the land holdings in Scotland are effective local land monopolies. So in many aspects of our national life, we regulate monopolies to make sure that they cannot exploit their power against the public interest. And it is time for a powerful land regulator. No, I'm not going to take an intervention. I'm sorry, I've, I haven't got time. I've got very few minutes, sorry. Uh, it is time for there to be a powerful land regulator to examine whether existing land ownerships help or hinder serving the public interest fulfilling people's human rights and delivering greater social justice. Powers are needed so that it cannot be if it cannot be shown that actions can be taken to impact the land ownership behaviours to, to deliver necessary change, that should include the potential breakup of land holdings exploiting their monopoly position. The Minister refers in the motion to the good work of the Land Commission. It has indeed made a promising start. But as my amendment, Scottish Labour's amendment, which I now move, makes it clear, we need to deliver for us, the detail, for the country, the detailed thinking and proposals that will allow further progress towards ensuring the public interest in land ownerships is met. In this context, we'll also be supporting the Green Party amendment. How can we provide disincentives to large land ownings being created in the future, possibly through a range of fiscal mechanisms? I welcome the Scottish Land Commission report of yesterday and its recommendations that would, cre that would create radical change by means of statutory change, but also by targeted policy work and voluntary collaboration. These would have the effect, many of the recommendations, a, a huge impact on addressing land inequality here in Scotland. We will support the Scottish Government motion today and if the Cabinet Secretary acts to secure further really radical progress on these fronts, she will have the support of Scottish Labour and indeed Labour in doing so. If she does not, uh, although I, I have faith in, in the collective experience of, of most of this chamber, if she does not, Scottish Labour in government here or and at the UK level will instruct the Land Commission to provide Parliament with the options it needs to act for greater change in our land ownership to deliver land justice for Scotland and to bring an end to the centuries of injustice inherent in how our land is owned. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Andy Whiteman to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Andy well, thanks very much, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my name. And I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for bringing this timely debate. And as she notes, uh, land reform is a difficult process. We're dealing, as the government motion hints at, with an entrenched set of circumstances brought about by a very long history. A very long history whereby men uh, who owned land and property had the exclusive right to sit in Parliament, who made the laws governing the ownership of la that land, men who ensured that primogeniture was only abolished in 1964, who ensured that even to this day children have no legal right to inherit land in Scotland, who have contrived to ensure that a wide range of exemptions from tax apply to landed estates that do not apply to other property owners. Now, as other members have indicated, this Parliament has made important steps to reverse this entrenched system, but there remains, remains a very, very long way to go.
Presiding officer, I want to begin by defining what I mean as land reform. And I take the definition from the land reform review group that the Scottish Government set up and which reported in 2014, who define land reform as, I quote, measures that modify or change the arrangements governing the possession and use of land in Scotland in the public interest. <clears throat> now, that implies a wide range of measures dealing with all land, urban, rural, marine, public, as well as private. It's about fiscal policy, succession law, planning, land tenure, and many other areas of law and policy. It is not synonymous with community ownership, because fundamentally this is a debate about power, specifically about how power is derived, defined, distributed, and exercised. And so I welcome the focus in the Scottish Land Commission's uh, report yesterday um, that uh, talks about the concentration of power. And I am reminded, in fact, of Tony Benn's famous five questions which he would ask of those who purported to hold power. He asked, what power have you got? Where did you get it from? In whose interest do you use it? To whom are you accountable? And how do we get rid of you? Anyone who cannot answer that last question, he claimed, does not live in a democratic system. And I think that's a very, very good test for Scotland's system of land tenure. Presenting officer, the core challenge that Parliament faces is how to redistribute power over land in the public interest, in the interest of the many and not the few. In short, it is about how to democratise Land. And the Law Commission, uh, I beg your pardon, the Scottish Land Commission report is refreshingly clear, analytical, nuanced, and provides a frank assessment of the problem. Because for too long, much of this debate has been conducted by soundbite. I have indulged in a good deal of this myself. Um, and an effort to be taken seriously and to attract attention, easy slogans, simplistic analysis, has too often taken the place of patient diagnosis. Now, I've long held the view that the ownership and occupation and use of land is a question of power. And as the Land Commission notes, power can and is abused. It can also be exercised with great responsibility and diligence. The report talks about monopolies and market power, of rent-seeking as the hallmark of market power. And importantly, it distinguishes how power is exercised from how it is obtained. Recognising that just because power can be exercised in damaging ways or responsible ways, it's actually the existence of that power that needs to change. But the future of communities in Scotland should not rely on the arbitrary manner in which power is obtained through land markets, through inheritance, or exercised by way of land use. Now, presiding officer, my amendment does two things. First of all, it replaces the term community ownership with common ownership. Common ownership includes community ownership, but recognises too that other forms of common ownership, such as common good land, parish commons, land held by local councils, grazing, uh, 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 common grazings, should also be the norm. And I hope members can agree that this more, more inclusive term is helpful and does nothing to take away from the importance of community ownership. It then concludes by inviting Parliament not to agree the recommendations of this report, but to endorse the findings. I hope members can support that. Presiding officer, this parliament began life enacting a wide range of legislation, as Claudia Beamish noted, dealing with tenements, national parks, crofting, community right to buy, the right to roam, feudal abolition. By 2007, it had lost its way on this topic. Momentum declined and little further was done until the Land Reform Review Group was established. That then followed with the Land Reform Act of 2016, establishing the Scottish Land Commission. Now, to some, the Scottish Land Commission was regarded as another tiresome quango. I was always very, very aware that land reform is difficult, it's deep-seated, it's entrenched, and the presence of an agency committed to the study, analysis, uh, and advice on that topic would be critical. Now, opposition, I know, to change is vigorous and determined. The establishment of the Land Commission allows important elements of this debate not to be forgotten. It allows for detailed analysis to be conducted to inform public debate, and the latest report is a good example of that. And what we hear from the Conservative Party, and indeed the landed class, is a masterclass in distraction. The idea that the ownership and power over land does not matter, that in a great um, uh, clamour of whataboutery, we should look at how it's used, has been a, has, has, has been a common theme um, from politicians uh, like Mr Mountain, to whom I will readily give way. Edward Mountain. I hardly think it's my common theme, presiding officer, but quoting from the Land Commission's report, the summary of macro themes identified for the call for evidence, there are five. Three of them think that large land ownership actually brings advantage, local economics, and to the natural environment. 
and one of them's undecided on agriculture. So there's five themes. Three say that big land ownership is, is not a problem. Two say it is. Do you accept that? Andy Whiteman. I confess I haven't read the report in such detail to be able to come to a conclusive view on that. I suspect that may be a selective reading of what's written. But, uh, Presiding Officer, um, this report is indeed a wake-up call. Uh, we need uh, action. And in closing, uh, later this afternoon, I will highlight a couple of examples where flagrant abuse has arisen as a consequence of our collective failure to put in place democratic governance arrangements for land ownership. But for the moment, I look forward to hearing other members uh, what they have to say and encourage members to support my amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Julian Martin. Thank you very much, Presiding uh, Officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak briefly during this afternoon's debate on land reform. It's still a source of pride for me that Scottish Liberal Democrats put land reform right at the heart of the legislative programme uh, in the early years of this Parliament, promoting rights of access and delivering community right to buy and crofting community right to buy through the Land Reform Act in 2003. This was always envisaged to be a first step, recognising that an incremental approach was going to be necessary in taking forward a genuinely ambitious land reform agenda. However, it began the process of addressing an area of policy that had for far too long been ignored, signalling very powerfully the positive difference that a devolved parliament could and should be making. As a Spice Spotlight um, blog highlights, Prior to devolution, government policy on land reform was widely considered to be conspicuous by its absence. It goes on to conclude the development of land reform as a distinctive policy area centred on communities and sustainable development is perhaps one of Parliament's most noteworthy actions. Of course, Conservative MSPs in successive Parliaments have felt the need, for whatever reason, to oppose almost every phase of the land reform agenda. I even recall some members referring to Mugabe-style power grabs. While I agree that the case for an absolute right to buy has still not been made, I cannot accept that there is not more that we can and should be doing to reform the way that land is owned and managed, the way in which decisions about its use are taken, and the way in which the benefits of one of Scotland's most important assets are felt. Sadly, while his comments earlier were characteristically considered, Edward Mountain's amendment does give the impression that there's no acceptance, even now on the Tory benches, of the need for further reform. Having been dragged kicking and screaming to this point, it seems that the remainder of the journey is likely to follow a similar pattern. That is, I think, unfortunate, not least uh, because of the fact that I believe Mr Mountain and a number of his colleagues have a great deal to contribute to this debate. Underlying the case for reform, of course, is the Scottish Land Rights and Responsibility Statement from 2017, which states that, quote, all land contributes to a modern and successful country and where rights and responsibilities in relation to land are fully recognised and fulfilled. It would be difficult, I think, for anyone to disagree with that sentiment, albeit I recognise that people will come to different conclusions in response. However, I think the Scottish Land Commission have done excellent work in trying to pull together some key themes as well as offering a number of recommendations for the way forward. I think Edward Mountain is absolutely right to say that it will take a little time to digest this detail. Indeed, the Commission itself accepts that it will need to consult extensively on its proposals before coming to a final view. Given their significance, it seems inevitable that there will be a lively bit debate about these proposals, and that is to be welcomed and indeed uh, encouraged. However, I think it's premature at this stage for Parliament to be calling on the government to accept all of the recommendations, and on that basis, I can't support the amendment in Claudia Beamish's name. Andy Whiteman, by contrast, calls on us to accept the findings of the Land Commission's report, and I've less difficulty with that. The evidence taken thus far by the com Commission has been extensive, and the analysis appears to me to be reasonably balanced, taking account of the wide range of arguments there are on this issue. What decisions government and the parliament uh, should take on the back of the commission's findings, I think, is for another day. But Scottish Liberal Democrats are certainly happy to support those findings. In particular, I recognise the pressing need to bring a greater degree of transparency to who owns land in Scotland. This, it seems to me, is absolutely critical. Whatever decisions or approach we take going forward, if nothing else, clarity over ownership is fundamental to accountability and, indeed, uh, equity when it comes to paying taxes. It's clear, though, 
that such clarity and transparency is some way off. Andy Whiteman, I think, recently described the Scottish land information system as next to useless, a view that Kate Forbes, to her great credit, uh, did not appear to entirely dispute, although she did uh, use rather more ministerial language in doing so. Presiding officer, there are clearly many aspects to this issue that are worthy of debate, but I want to use the remainder of my time uh, this afternoon uh, to focus on the valuable contribution made by the Scottish Land Fund. This collaborative initiative between the Scottish Government, Big Lottery, Highlands and Islands Enterprise has awarded over 500 million in 2017-18, helping make a significant contribution to communities across the country. In my own constituents of Orkney, last November saw sizeable awards being made to three different development trusts. Over 147,000 was awarded to Westry Development Trust for the purchase of the former Harbour Master's House in Pirawal, which will be transformed into four apartments for affordable rent, helping respond to the acute shortage of accommodation on the island. Rousey, Egglesy and Wire Development Trust we were granted 260,000 for the purchase of the Trumland uh, estate on Rousey, taking 15% of the island into community hands. Community ownership will create part-time employment opportunities for a project manager and arranger, as well as allowing the Trust to explore improvements to broadband and mobile connectivity. Finally, Papi Development Trust received 167,000 uh, to purchase a four-bedroom uh, detached house to help meet the urgent need for long-stay affordable family homes for rent on that island. Uh, the Land Fund was set up to help build resilience in communities across the country, and there's no question that these three projects will do exactly that. From my regular visits to the Isles over the re recent years and having been brought up in one of the North Isles of Sandy, I know how much of a priority the availability of housing has been. Without suitable accommodation, creating and sustaining jobs in the Isles becomes impossible. Ultimately, giving communities the tools they need to address the specific challenges they face and to take advantage of the opportunities they have is absolutely the right approach. And that, in a sense, encapsulates for me what land reform should be about. And on that basis, Scottish Liberal Democrats are committed to playing our full part in taking forward the next four phase of this important agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we move to the open part of the debate. I call Gillian Martin to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. Um, since the passing of the Land Reform Act, we've had a chance to reflect on whether Scotland's communities are thriving as a result of land reform. In the short six months that I've been convener of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, I've been party to some key developments relating to land reform. The first was the scrutiny of the Crown Estate Bill. The second, the current development of the Register of Persons with a Controlling Interest in Land, is the mechanism for identifying who, who owns what in all areas of the country. The first of these should ensure that Crown Estate exists largely for public good and should boost local economic and social potential. The second of these should go a long way to solving one of the main historical problems associated with identifying landowners. And crucially, it puts in place obligations for landowners to engage with correspondents. The third happened yesterday and was, as many people have already said, the report published by the Scottish Land Commission on large scale and concentrated ownership in Scotland. It's a significant and challenging report, reviewing whether we still have work to do in making sure the current pattern of ownership is benefiting us all. One phrase from the report immediately drew my eye, and it was this, a quote, there is an urgent need for formal mechanisms to be put in place that would enable harmful land monopolies to be identified and changes in either ownership or management practice to be implemented that would protect fragile rural communities from the irresponsible exercise of power. Yesterday, when asked on television about the Scottish Land Commission's recommendation that government put these mechanisms in place, a Conservative member in this place called it stealing. Well, I think this language is unhelpful, and I was surprised to hear the rights of communities to fair treatment and social justice being dismissed so bluntly. One thing's very clear to me, there's a huge difference between responsible and irresponsible land ownership. And today I'm sure that many of my colleagues will be pointing to examples of responsible ownership. Landowners working collaboratively with communities for their mutual benefit and successful transfer of land assets into the hands of communities. There are so many good news stories to tell that show the Land Reform Act has opened up opportunities. But there are also cases of where large landowners have put significant e effort and investment into communities and that is to be applauded. But the fact that many correspondents to the Scottish Land Commission felt strongly that their community was stifled through having their economic and social potential diminished in myriad ways is of great concern. 
They identified particular landowner types who were still an issue. First, landlords who actively engaged negatively with communities. One case mentioned a, ca a case of an excellent landlord who worked well with the community but left his estate to his son who was hostile to the community and actively undid the good work of his father. Others referenced refusal, refusal to renew long-standing tenancy agreements. And there's one example of a landowner refusing permission for a community-run wind turbine on aesthetic grounds only to install his own turbine later that year. The report also referenced problems with absentee landlords who only appeared occasionally to indulge in sporting activities and showed no other interest in the estate or the community around it. Particularly significant were the views that the ability of a dominant landowner to control the supply of housing was a key driver of depopulation and economic decline in rural areas. The Land Commission heard from communities wanting to build affordable housing, securing capital from the Scottish Land Fund based on market value of land after a landlord indicated they'd be willing to sell, only to be thwarted because he demanded much more than the market value. The report also mentioned an unnamed charitable organisation refusing a crofter the right to upgrade their home to make it warm and bring it into the 21st century, and the woman ended up living in a caravan. Testimony of some of the tactics landlords, some landlords in, used to keep communities in line or disempower them were quite distressing to read. From a state factors been sent to intimidate and identify those with tied housing who went to public meetings. Yes. Edward Mountain. I seem to remember that particular point and, and, and that related to a factor attending a meeting at, sitting at the front and taking notes, which, which one person found intimidating. Now, I read that. I have been a factor. I have attended meetings. I have taken notes. And I've wanted to report back to all the people that I saw giving evidence uh, on, on the comments they've made. Will you accept that that might not be viewed as intimidation, but it was in one case by one person viewed as intimidation? Julian Martin. That intervention, and obviously, I'm unlike Edward Mountain, who seems I seem to be dismissive of some of the testimony of people. I'm reading the testimony in the whole. I've already mentioned as well. There's also been well, when when one person comes to my constitu constituency surgery and says that they have a problem with someone, I don't ask. Oh well, how many other people are affected? How, what proof have you got that this is an issue for more people? I take that person at face value. Exactly. So. Uh, Run, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, I'm going to skip a bit of my speech because I took that intervention. Now, maybe these negative experiences are few and far between, but the question we must ask is, how can this irresponsible land ownership be dealt with? And are land monopolies good for Scotland? I have to say, I also question whether large tracts of Scotland's land planted solely with conifers as an investment opportunity and to attract government grants is in the public interest. There seems to be a lot of that kind of thing going on. Is this land that could be used more productively to give livelihoods to new entrant farmers or provide much needed rural housing or be planted with a range of indigenous trees that would nurture mu much needed biodiversity? Presiding officer, we've seen how land reforms this government and the former governments have done been beneficial to communities in Scotland. But this report shows that there is a need to do more. Of particular interest is the idea of having public interest tests and tackling the powerful monopolies that exist in certain geographical areas. The report makes some interesting recommendations on which I hope to be able to question the Scottish Land Commission, stakeholders and the government in the near future. Presiding officer. Thank you very much, Sir Call. Finley Carson, to be followed by Alec Rowley. Alex Thank Rowley. you, presiding officer. I'm pleased to be speaking in the debate today, a week after I spoke in Andy Whiteman's members' debate discussing who owns Scotland. The subject of land reform in Scotland has long been debated in this chamber, and indeed we've had 19 acts in this very parliament since 1999, which have contained some form of land reform measures. As Edward Mountain uh, said, I also welcome moves towards transparency when it comes to land ownership. Uh, as also mentioned by the Cabinet Secretary. However, we must be very mindful of the rights of individual owners, and especially in light of events south of the border, when vegan protesters obtained the names and addresses online uh, and used the information to target farms and farmers, causing damage uh, and severe distress uh, to those involved. I hope that the Scottish Government can commit to introducing protective measures as part of a wider land reform to ensure farmers and other landowners are not open to intimidation in relation to the land that they own or the legal use of that land. As a constituency MSP for Galloway and Western Freese, 
I've always highlighted the damaging centralisation from the Scottish Government on a number of issues, so it's only right that I welcome steps taken to empower local communities. But we should ensure that the focus is on good land management and use, not necessarily who owns it. Yesterday's report from the Scottish Land Commission will no doubt play a significant part in this afternoon's debate. And I wish to put on record my concerns about the failure of the report to recognise the huge contribution made by many rural landowning businesses, which help support the local economy in a, su a substantial way. I was disappointed that even the report title set an unfortunate tone. And I quote, investigation into the issues associated with large scale and concentrated land ownership in Scotland. The report apparently shows how the concentration of social, economic and decision-making powers significantly impacts communities across rural Scotland. But where's the information about how positively significant the impact uh, of some, if, to some communities who benefit from large-scale and concentrated land ownership? Certainly. Andy Wayman. I thank the member for taking intervention. He expresses concern uh, at the title. Does he accept that there are any issues associated with large-scale and concentrated land ownership in Scotland? Or is he arguing that this is all just uh, make-believe? Finlay Carson. At all, of course, there is some issues, but I think it should have been balanced and it should also recognise there's some benefits to be gained by large-scale ownership. Yeah. The, the report apparently shows... Big upon, moving on. When looking at the big picture, are the impacts significant? Are they significant when compared to the impact of local, local planning policy or more importantly, government policy in relation to forestry targets or peat restoration targets or renewable energy targets or indeed agricultural production targets. No, we've not heard a public outcry for further land reform. And I, I think this uh, whole agenda has been driven by this government. And there's a risk that this could, be, uh, it could herald a one-sided debate when it comes to future land reform and land ownership, planting the idea quite wrongly that concentrated land ownership puts fragile communities at risk. Because we've seen some fantastic examples of landowners and communities working closely together. In my constituency, we've got uh, the Mull of Galloway Trust, the Kikubri Community Trust with its Bar Hill uh, Woods uh, takeover. And when I was councillor uh, in, Dumfries and, in Dumfries and Galloway Council, I was delighted to see the benefits of concentrated land ownership in the village of Dalton. The dormant estate saw the creation of eight new homes which met a standard in relation to low energy standards that were well above UK standards. And much credit should be given to Jamie Carruthers for the two three bedroom houses uh, that he, he built in response to his concerns about the lack of rural housing. Now Jamie's not a large landowner, but he was determined to fix a problem when it came to housing in rural Dumfries and Galloway. After carrying out surveys and fighting a long battle, with local planners, local road authorities, the houses were eventually built with the support of a Scottish Government grant. These award-winning houses benefited the community, including keeping local children in the school. Now the question is, now would Jamie have passed the fairness test supported by this Scottish Land Commission and by this uh, government? Would they see it as wrong that this estate owner owns all the land and all the houses? I do fear that Jamie may well fail this test. You know, even Housing Minister Kevin Stewart, when visiting the estate in 2017, welcomed the passive house approach to helping remove the threat of fuel poverty and uh, bringing more uh, rural housing. So when it comes to this sort of concentrated ownership, can we not celebrate that it actually works and not try to move the goalposts at every opportunity when it comes to land reform? Another issue I'd like to mention uh, that I have in, in terms of Dumfries and Galloway, and it's to do with land reform as well, is people's rights and responsibilities when it comes to accessing parts uh, of the land and freedom to roam or whatever is part of land reform. I've been dealing with a constituent uh, in the village of Ringford where there's been a core path installed at his address which he believes directly contravenes the Land Reform Act of 2003 as well as the 2005 Scottish Outdoor Access Code. He's raised a number of concerns uh, around privacy with the core path giving clear view uh, into his home, uh, linking that with security and the inability for him to have his uh, pets roam. Furthermore, there are issues over horses using the path causing damage to the driveway he owns 
And, and if the core path was to be established now, it would be considered as unlawful. So I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary to commit to ensure that local authorities are following the right guidelines when it comes to the siting of core paths and ensure that when it comes to issues of land use, that the rights and responsibilities of the, the owners are also correctly followed. Today's debate comes at a hugely important juncture when it comes to land reform measures across Scotland. I believe the approach from the Scottish Government doesn't recognise the good work that has been done across our rural communities when it comes to working together on good uh, land management practice from landowners and communities. We must ensure that any reforms truly benefit our rural communities where landowners are working with communities and making a substantial difference on a daily basis. Thank you. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Mr Rowley, please. President Officer, I welcome the debate today on land reform in Scotland and agree with the Cabinet Secretary that land is one of Scotland's most important assets. And it is because land is one of our most important assets that any considerations of land reform should be scrutinised in depth and we should ensure that reforms create a more equal society when it comes to land ownership, land purchasing and land use. It will take many years to fully rectify the impact of the feudal system that was abolished by Labour in the early life of this Parliament, but progress is being made. I do think, however, we can be more bold around ownership with new policy like that set out this week by the Scottish Land Commission. And indeed, we should also be much more open when it comes to the potential role of land value tax, wider taxation and fiscal policy around land. Redistribution of wealth has always been key to the Labour political agenda as a method for reducing inequality, tackling poverty and addressing the inherent failures within our society that allows a mass accumulation of money for a select few while others strive on a daily basis just to get by. Land wealth is as much of an issue as monetary wealth. Indeed, with an estimated total value of around £5 trillion, land is the most valuable asset in the UK. When 432 people own 50% of Scotland's private rural land, it is obvious that there is an inbuilt inequality in our modern land system. So the question of land reform is incredibly important and if reformed in the right way has the potential to radically transform our society for the better by creating a more equal, fairer and even more productive country. It is also important to raise the issue of land management as outlined by the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association when they say that two large land agency firms are factoring a significant proportion of the tenanted sector, resulting in tenants being subjected to further inequalities. The association say, and I quote, the experience of farm tenants in areas of concentrated land ownership within the tenanted sector demonstrate the ability for large landowners to exercise disproportionate influence and power. In contrast, they say, in areas where the large estates have been sold and have more fragmented ownership structures, a new tenanted sector has developed where there is a better balance of power between landowner, landowner and tenant. These areas benefit from improved fairness and equality, have more confident and resilient communities and demonstrate increased investment and in entrepreneurialism. So the question remains, how do we best reform our land system for the benefit of the country as a whole and not simply a select few who make the vast sums of money from the land that belongs to us all? As I said, I welcome the report from the Scottish Land Commission and congratulate their work on investigating the issues of large-scale ownership and concentrated land ownership in Scotland. The findings and recommendations from this report are an excellent starting point for looking at ways to address the inadequacies of current land ownership and indeed land management. It seems strange to me that we have a system whereby there is no obligation to use land in the public interest. 
I agree with the recommendations from the Land Commission that this needs to address, be addressed and a public interest test for significant land transfers or acquisitions is a step in the right direction. This ties in with further recommendations for land holdings to engage on and publish management plans for a new review process where there is evidence of adverse impact and creating the more robust mechanisms to ensure local democratic influence on and benefiting from land use change. And while I welcome strengthening community right to buy and the recommendation to investigate policy options to encourage a more diverse patterns of private ownership and investment, these changes will take a considerable period of time to come through. Presiding officer, I spoke at the beginning about land value tax, general taxation, and I take the view there is something we can do now, a short-term action for the long term to address some of the issues of inequality through a model, a model of land valuation tax. If we want Scotland's land to work for the many, then we should not be timid in approach, nor should we be put off by those who act in the interest of the few. I do hope that the report from the Scottish Land Commission on this debate today will generate some cross-party cooperation to bring about the change that is needed in land ownership and taxing land in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by John Scott. Mr Gibson, please. Th uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Land ownership has been contentious for centuries. However, Scottish policy towards land is now increasingly rooted in the questions of fairness, equality and human rights. I'm proud of the actions this government has taken to remedy some inequalities relating to land ownership, building on the work of previous administrations. From the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016, which empowered more communities to own and have a say about land, to the Scottish Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement, the first of its kind in the world, to the Scottish Land Fund, important steps have been taken towards ending the hegemony of the landed gentry in Scotland. Nevertheless, Scotland still has the most concentrated pattern of private land ownership in Europe. It is estimated that half of Scotland's private loan land is in the ownership of just 400 individuals. Indeed, just as the Isle of Arran in my constituency is often described as Scotland in miniature for its landscapes, the island's land ownership pattern is also illustrative of a wider issue. In 2015, Brodick Beach had all but disappeared as a consequence of rapid erosion precipitated by the practice of extracting sand for export years earlier. Erosion also threatens the village green in Lamlash. Both areas are important not only for the thousands who visit Arran each year, but for local residents who rely on these outdoor spaces for a variety of community events and activities. The future of such spaces lay at the mercy of Arran Estates, the land management company controlled by the Ford family, who have owned large swathes of the island for more than six centuries, following a fruitful marriage in the 15th century. At the time, North Ayrshire Council received criticism for supposedly permitting erosion of these areas. However, its reluctance to spend six-figure sums of public money on land under the Ford's private ownership was understandable. The family then gifted some of the most eroded areas to North Ayrshire Council, wiping out their liability to deal with the erosion, which is now the responsibility of the taxpayer. North Ayrshire Council has to lease more than 50,000 square metres of land from Arne Estates at a cost of tens of thousands of pounds each year to access the semi-industrial area to the south of Brodick and areas in Brodick, Lamlash and the foreshore in Whiting Bay. This situation encapsulates the environmental, economic and social detriment that concentrated land ownership can have on some of our communities. Yesterday saw publication of the most substantial piece of research into the impact large-scale and concentrated land ownership has in Scotland. That, that threw up many issues for this Parliament and Scottish Ministers to examine, discuss and hopefully remedy. While previous reports focused on relatively small in-depth case studies, the Scottish Land Commission set up by this government in 2016 heard from 407 stakeholders, ranging from landowners and managers to tenants and community representatives. The evidence gathered showed that most of the disadvantages associated with Scotland's current pattern of land ownership relate to the concentration of social, economic and decision-making power, not simply the size or scale of land holdings. The concentrated land ownership we have can impede economic development and the Land Commission's report found that this is causing significant and long-term harm to impacted communities. For example, rural economic development relies on the ability of businesses or housing providers to access land for expansion and confidence to invest. If ownership is too concentrated, a few landowners can control this and the economic health of that area can lie in their hands. 
As described in the report, the anti-development stance of some landowners could be motivated by a desire to preserve land as, and I quote, a playground for very wealthy people. Sadly, one respondent even felt that, and I quote again, the people who live here play second fiddle to whatever is best for the pheasant. Island communities are particularly vulnerable. The book Dr Green of Sussex and the Island of Rassi tells a story of how that absentee landowner in the 70s refused to allow construction of a pier, causing huge damage to that fragile community. A £12 million pier eventually being built by this government. A number of submissions stated that, unfortunately, there is little or no redress for communities or individuals who suffer adverse economic or social impacts arising from land owned by a single individual or organisation. While well, the opportunity for communities to participate in decisions relating to the use of land is severely limited. In light of the negative effects of concentrated land ownership, the Commission made recommendations directly informed by the evidence to help redress adverse impacts and stimulate a more diverse pattern of land ownership. For example, that the Scottish Government introduces a public interest test for significant land transfers and acquisitions, as is already used in some other countries, such as South Africa. This would protect the public interest and limit the negative impact on local economies and communities. Of course, the criteria for triggering a public interest test would need careful consideration, but this recommendation should certainly be considered. The Commission also advocates a requirement that all land holdings uh, of a substantial nature should publish a management plan. I believe this to be realistic and reasonable, meaning landowners must demonstrate how their management delivers against the land rights and responsibilities statement and connects with local priorities, opportunities and public policy. This would improve transparency and encourage greater community collaboration, mitigating risks associated with concentration of ownership. It is imperative that this Parliament considers how to foster a more diverse and dynamic pattern of private and community ownership. Presiding officer, this report puts to bed the question of whether ownership is an issue and provides us with the evidence base to understand the issues concentrated land ownership creates and how they can be addressed. The monopoly of land ownership in Scotland uh, intersects a variety of legislative and policy areas. However, I am pleased that the Scottish Government will work closely with the Scottish Land Commission to consider its recommendations. Such reforms will doubt, uh, doubtlessly be to the benefit of local communities, increasing transparency and repairing harm inflicted over many generations to many people and many communities. Thank you very much, Mr Gibson. I call John Scott to be followed by Angus MacDonald. Angus MacDonald will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Scott. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by declaring an interest as a farmer and food producer, as well as declaring a member of NFUS. Can I also welcome this debate today and the publishing of the Scottish Land Commission report yesterday. And let me say at the outset how disappointed I am at this report. Presiding officer, the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee last week, Andrew Thin and Hamish Trench, went to great lengths to say this report would be evidence-based. I'm afraid I don't believe that this assertion stands up to any reasonable analysis. On the contrary, this report appears to make significant recommendations based on subjective evidence from a small group of people who, in my view, are not representative of the majority of people of rural Scotland and recommendations which are at odds with the Scottish Government's own research carried out in 2016. And as someone who has spent a lifetime amongst the people of rural Scotland and in some of the poorest communities, I simply do not recognise, nor have I come across the views which are being called evidence, for example, that concentration of land ownership is a problem for the people of rural Scotland. On the contrary, I have found land and the state owners who take what they see as their duties to help and support local communities seriously and often at considerable personal expense to themselves. I have heard, I'm afraid I don't have time, Andy, but thank you for the offer. I have heard of, and the evidence in this report confirms there are no, that there are real problems with NGOs who do not see it as their role to consider the needs of their local communities, given the narrow focus of their remit. I know that the Scottish Government is already among the largest landowners in Scotland, and I'm particularly interested to hear how the Scottish Government intend to respond to this report's suggestion that large parcels of land owned by individuals or institutions should be split up to avoid concentrations of power. I am aware of land and estate owners doing all they can to support government policy by planting trees and taking welcome government grants to do so, one of the concerns raised by those giving evidence to this report. 
I'm aware of land and estate owners supporting government policy by welcoming wind farms and small scale hydroelectric developers onto their land to help decarbonise our energy supply and to help in the fight against climate change. I'm sure that will be looked forward to being discussed next week in the green business. I'm aware of landowners and managers constant battles with local authorities to get planning permission to build housing in rural Scotland and that's all sorts of housing with planning policy again directed by government policy and legislation. I'm aware of the lack of available tenancies as raised by the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association but even they recognise that this is entirely the product of Scottish government legislation. I'm aware of the growing isolation in rural Scotland, particularly among the elderly, exacerbated by reducing bus services, again driven by Scottish government policy. And I'm also aware of mental health issues and growing drug abuse, as well as suicides in rural Scotland, and again, little being done to address this. So, presiding officer, these are some of the real problems that the people of rural Scotland are facing. And usually I hear blame for these real problems being laid at the feet of the Scottish Government, but very rarely at the feet of the local landowner. They are different completely from the perceived problems of this report, which appears to have started with the conclusion and then scratched about to find the weakest of evidence, mostly anecdotal, to support politically driven conclusions. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I would have expected more from this Scottish Land Commission report, which appears at its most fundamental to have taken a small number of long-held local grievances and used this as evidence to support the politically driven agenda of those standing behind it. I would expect more of the Scottish Government who should set about and address the very real problems of rural Scotland rather than the ones that are being debated today. This report is not reflective of the reality that is rural Scotland and should be dismissed as it does not take a balanced view of the realities in rural Scotland or even more alarmingly endeavour to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much Mr Scott and I call Angus Macdonald then we move to closing speeches. Mr Macdonald please. Thank you uh, President Officer. Firstly I'm obliged to refer the Chamber to my register of interests with regard to a non-domestic property I own in the Western Isles which is situated within an estate that is subject to a live community buyout attempt. Um, <clears throat> negotiations are at a sensitive and challenging stage, so I'll not be making any further mention of it in this speech. Um, President Officer, I'm proud to have been involved in the former Iraqi Committee's work on the 2016 Land Reform Bill, and I have to say it's been the bill that I have most enjoyed working on since coming into this place in 2011. Uh, now, before I, I go any further into my speech, I think it's worth noting and recalling that amongst the 60 recommendations of the Independent Land Reform Review, Review Group, which reported back in 2014 in advance of the Land Reform Bill, it stated that there was no single measure or silver bullet that would modernise land ownership patterns in Scotland and deliver land reform measures which would better serve the public interest. However, our committee and subsequently the Act took account of some of the review group's recommendations, and I'm delighted to say we saw a significant piece of legislation created for land reform, land management, and communities across Scotland. And that, coupled with the Community Empowerment Act of 2014, another bill that I was pleased to work on, it has helped move land reform forward significantly from the early days in this parliament with the groundbreaking acts of 2003 and 2004. Our Iraqi committee paid specific attention at the time to human rights and its compatibility with ECHR and other international agreements. We understood that taking a human rights centred approach offered a new way in which to consider land reform. However, it has to be said that ECHR provides challenges too, and in my personal view prevented us from being as radical as I and no doubt others uh, would have wished. It always struck me as ironic that ECHR was holding us back from righting the wrongs of the past that cleared vast swathes of the Highlands and Islands during the clearances, and I make no apology for re reminding the Chamber of that dreadful period in our country's history. And as a Highlander and an Islander, it is something that I or we can never forget. But that said, presiding officer, the motion we are debating today looks at the here and now and to the future. So 
We were pleased this week to have the opportunity at our Declare Committee to take evidence from the Scottish Land Commission's Chair, Andrew Thin, and the Chief Executive, Hamish Trench, and it was heartening to see the SLC doing exactly as we had intended for it to do when the Bill was being developed and scrutinised in Parliament three years ago. Its purpose is to provide direction, leadership and strategic thought to land reform in Scotland, in effect, picking up where Parliament left off. The SLC's overriding vision, which contributes to six key national outcomes and guides their objectives of productiv productivity, diversity and accountability, is a fair, inclusive and productive system of ownership, management and use of land that delivers greater benefit for all the people of Scotland. So I was pleased to hear both the Chair and Chief Executive confirm that the Commissioners are making good progress in implementing their strategic priorities for the period 2018 to 21, concentrating on land for housing and development, land ownership, land use decision making and agricultural holdings. So they've certainly got their work cut out uh, for themselves. And of course, as we've heard, the, the SLC published yesterday its investigation into the issues associated with large scale and concentrated land ownership in Scotland. It's a welcome report, uh, President Officer, however, due to timing, which clearly can't be helped, it would have been beneficial if the report had been issued before we took evidence from the Commission on Tuesday. But that's not a criticism of anyone, it's just bad timing. And I note the Cabinet Secretary's comment that the report was brought forward, uh, so it could be discussed at this debate. Um, as we've heard, the SLC concluded that much of Scotland is owned by a handful of landowners who have an, and I quote, irresponsible exercise of power, end quote. It also concluded that many parts of Scotland are controlled by a land monopoly with very little in the way of legal protection and has recommended that to help introduce a systematic change to stimulate a more diverse and dynamic pattern of land ownership, there should be a public interest test in any future significant land transfers or acquisitions. It also calls for a statutory framework to strengthen local, uh, strengthen local democratic accountability of land ownership and use. So I think, presiding officer, uh, I can perhaps feel another land reform bill coming on in the next session of Parliament. Uh, clearly we'll have to, to wait and see. But all those welcome proposals contained in the report seek to address the risks of concentrated land ownership in ways that are considered normal in other developed countries, particularly in Northern Europe. So today's motion also refers to the Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement, which adopts a human rights approach to land rights and responsibilities. And it signals a determination to continue leading the way in ensuring that Scotland's urban and rural land contributes to inclusive and sustainable economic growth and to social justice. And it's noticeable that the Tory amendment uh, removes mention of the land rights and responsibilities statement and a uh, disappointing to say the least. Of course, much of the progress we've seen in recent years simply wouldn't have happened without the Scottish Land Fund. With just over 560,000 acres of land now in community ownership, the Scottish Land Fund continues to play its part in helping to get as close to the uh, 1 million target as possible. There are some fantastic good news stories, not least the community buyout of Alva, which has been one of the most heartening in recent years. Uh, President Officer, I have Mull connections going back a couple of hundred years. So when I saw the success of the North West Mull Community Woodland Trust and its purchase of Alva with the very generous assistance of the Scottish Land Fund, the Macquarie Group, and hundreds of amazing donations through crowdfunding, it was icing on the cake for me. But of course, President Officer, there's always more room for icing on the cake. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before uh, we move to winding up, there are two members who took part in the debate, Gillian Martin and Claudia Beamish, who are not in the chamber. I thought we'd got over all of this nonsense. Um, I'm expecting notes from them. I hope they're just sitting having a cup of tea and a cake and thinking that they can swallow in when they like. Especially Ms Beamish, who opened the debate for Labour Party um, in particular. Now, I now call Andy Whiteman, please. I've got a little time in hand, Mr Whiteman, so I can give you seven minutes, up to seven minutes. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Presiding Officer. Most grateful. Um, well, this has, I think, been a, a, a useful debate. Be informed, I think, as members have noted, by a very helpful report from the Scottish Land Commission, which, if members have not read it, I urge them to do so, uh, including the, the research review, uh, which I'll come to a little bit later. Um, members may know that it was at Aberdeen University that I became engaged with the land question. Uh, whilst I was there, the Flow Country debacle uh, was um, uh, 
hitting off. Members may recall uh, people like Terry Wogan and Shirley Porter getting vast tax breaks from the government at the time uh, to plant trees uh, in the far north of Scotland in Gail Ross's constituency. Um, and I remember a visiting lecturer who came uh, from the forestry industry to talk with glowing praise about this uh, endeavour. And uh, I asked why it was uh, felt to be appropriate that people who, rich people living in London should get tax breaks to plant trees in the north of Scotland. And I, I asked them why it would not be better to spend the tax revenues being foregone to support the farmers and the landowners and the communities in Caithness and Sutherland to plant the trees. That seemed to be more evident. I'm sure Mr Scott and the Conservatives would probably agree with that. It seemed to be a more sensible approach. Um, but I do remember, I don't really remember the answer, but I do remember my professor coming to me afterwards and saying that I shouldn't ask such political questions. Well, presiding officer, I've been asking them ever since, and I'm not going to stop um, asking questions about um, this topic until landed hegemony is eliminated and, eliminated and the people of Scotland own the land of Scotland. Now, I first met the Cabinet Secretary, I think, in the 1990s when she was a member of Parliament, and we were, don't worry, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we were part of a, a group we were, we, were, we were part of a group campaigning against the abandonment of tenant farms uh, by the owner of Blackford Estate, uh, owned then, as now indeed, by a company registered in the secrecy jurisdiction of Liechtenstein. And I know that uh, the Cabinet Secretary is committed to doing all in her power to advance the cause of land reform. But I know also uh, that within government this is not always an easy task, and I would uh, uh, guarantee that we Greens will do all in our power to assist her in that endeavour. Now, given that there remains so much more to do, um, I would hope, perhaps, that the Cabinet Secretary might be in a position to at least have a conversation with her colleagues uh, to use the legislative opportunity that I understand is planned to reform compulsory purchase powers and introduce compulsory sale orders to instead include such measures as Parts 1 and Parts 2, perhaps, of a land reform bill, therefore at least allowing this session of Parliament to deliver some further land reform uh, measures. Now, I mentioned in my opening remarks what the Scottish Law Commission, uh, examples of what the Scottish Law Commission is pointing to. And I want to just highlight a couple of examples. Uh, Applecross Estate in Western Ross is a 61,000 acre estate. It was owned by the Wills Tobacco family. Um, but in the 1970s, they transferred ownership to a company with charitable status in order to avoid tax. Since then, the Applecross Trust has operated as a closed shop with directors who live in the south of England and a fragile community which has struggled to secure land to meet basic needs for housing and other essential services. In September 2012, 100 of us, including the then local MP, the late Charles Kennedy, wrote formal letters to the registered office of this charity in Edinburgh, applying to become members, as under the terms of the charity's constitution was our right. All applications were refused point blank. Here is a landowner operating as a Scottish charity exercising monopoly control over vast swathes of land and denying everyone else, including the local MP, from joining and participating in the affairs of that charity. And a similar situation exists on the island of Butte, again owned by a charity, the Mount Stewart Trust, again established to avoid tax liabilities for the Marquis of Butte and operating a closed shop. Not only did they refuse applications from amongst others myself and the local MSP, Mike Russell, they then passed a special resolution um, at a, a special general meeting to limit membership and indeed give the Marquis of Butte exclusive rights to appoint up to four directors on terms and conditions dictated, and I quote, by the person holding the title and dignity of the Marquis of Butte. Presiding officer, we, I thought, abolished feudal tenure in 2000, but it lives on in the arcane, anti-democratic manner described in just these two uh, examples. Now, Claudia Beamish and Liam MacArthur uh, said that we had much more uh, to do, and I agree, and I have suggested perhaps one route in which we might do this. I would gently remind the Cabinet Secretary that opportunities have already been uh, missed. Uh, Long-standing proposals to give children legal rights to inherit land uh, were rejected by Scottish ministers uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, rejected too was a recommendation of the Barclay Review into non-domestic rates to ensure that all non-domestic property and land was on the valuation rule, a recommendation that was rejected. That's a necessary precondition if we're going to have any fiscal uh, reform. Now, John Scott asked 
uh, about Scottish ministers' uh, land. And it's a notable feature of this report, which I'm sure he'll welcome, that it made no distinction between private and public land. Um, and indeed, I agree uh, with John Scott. Years ago, the uh, historian Jim Hunter argued that the Forestry Commission is to Scottish forestry what collectivisation was to Soviet agriculture. Uh, we support the decentralised management and control of the National Forest Estate to communities, to local government and to NGOs, and I, I hope he agrees and might be about to do so. John Scott. To historians, I wondered if you'd also uh, re reflect on uh, the historian, uh, Mr. Devine, Tom Devine, who has changed his view, uh, uh, one clearly expressed by, your, by Angus MacLeod, uh, as to the, the cause of the Highland Clearances and how that, his view, has changed the whole perception of the land reform agenda, or it certainly should have. Andy White, will you please begin to wind up? Well, uh, yes, I'm not quite sure what... I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with um, Tom Devine's uh, comments in this uh, regard. Uh, but just to close, yes, indeed, uh, presiding officer, I would encourage John, Ross and his, uh, John uh, Scott and his colleagues to actually read the, the research review. It was done by Scotland's Rural College. It contains five pages of refer references. This is a very well-referenced uh, report. And I'm reminded of the Napier Commission. He's talking about the Highland Clearances. But for decades later, the Napier Commission, people criticised it and dismissed... Um, the eloquent testimony as mere anecdote, and I think that's very unfortunate uh, should anyone do so uh, today. Presiding officer, there is so much more to be done. The, Law Commission's work, the Land Commission's work over the, uh, the last year has been extremely useful, and I look forward to working with others to bring to an end the hegemony associated with Scotland's pattern of land ownership. We'll be supporting the Government and Labour amendments. Thank you very much. I call Rudy Grant to the Labour. Up to seven minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, and land reform has been a focus of this Parliament, and indeed, uh, from the very beginning of the Parliament, land reform was high on the agenda, as my colleagues Claudia Beamish and Alec Rowley pointed out. And I'm proud of these achievements, but I think <coughs> we can go so much further. Scottish, the Scottish Tenant Farmers Association wrote to us in their briefing to tell us that land reform had improved the lot of tenant farmers but we need to protect them further. And some landowners have responded to land reform in a despicable <coughs> way in their treatment of tenant farmers. Why do we need land reform? Well, 150 people own 50% of Scotland's privately owned rural land. As Claudia Beamish said, land ownership is power. It provides opportunity and it provides wealth. And the disparity of ownership empowers and it disempowers. Gillian Martin talked about someone feeling very intimidated at a meeting. And whether that was meant or not, it was the balance of power that led to that intimidation and fear. If somebody is there taking notes that you know has power over you, of course you're going to be afraid. And unless you've been in that position, maybe you don't understand the, the, the way that that power can disempower somebody else. We need to build thriving communities. And we need to make sure that the power is shared. And that can lead to doing very simple things like building homes, as Liam MacArthur pointed out. Alec Rowley talked about land wealth, and it's, it's worth um, just as much as monetary wealth. And that, again, is in the, la in the hands of the few rather than the many. And we need to look at better redistribution both of land wealth and monetary wealth. And he talked about land value taxation, which is something that we could look at now to make sure um, that land was not being used, as land often is, as a way to avoid tax. We see some of the large estate agents selling um, estates around Scotland and, and encouraging people to buy them, not because that they would work with a community and build a local economy, but that they could use this land to avoid their own taxation. Monopolies have always been seen and understood as bad things because it puts power into the hands of the monopoly and that dis disenfranchises everybody else. And land ownership in Scotland is largely a monopoly and that needs to change. Land is an asset that we all need to benefit from. When your livelihood depends on it, you need a voice in the decisions that are taken about land. And the very way of making sure that that voice is heard is making sure that you also have a stake in it. Now, I welcome the publication of the Land Commission report. And as Angus MacDonald pointed out, the Land Commission was set up 
to provide leadership and direction on land reform. Um, and I have not read it word for word, but I've certainly had a good look over um, and I like what I see in the fact that Edward Mountain was very critical of it. To me, it's a good sign. I think I'll like it even more as I delve into it. Um, I, and I also would be grateful, I, I'm also grateful to, to the Commission for rushing the publication of this to help inform this debate because I think it was an important part of this debate. And just picking some of their findings, they say in some parts of Scotland, concentrated land ownership is an impediment to economic development mm. and is causing significant and long-term harm to the communities affected. They also say there is little or no method of redress for communities or individual, individuals where there is an adverse economic or social impact arising from concentrated land ownership. Now, they make a number of recommendations and I hope that the Scottish Government will consider those seriously. Things like introducing a public interest test for significant land transfers and uh, acquisitions, and this was talked about by a number of people, uh, creating more robust mechanisms to ensure that local democratic influence and on, on and benefit from land use changes, and a programme of land rights and responsibilities um, for good practice. And John Scott did point out that some landowners take their responsibility seriously, and, and that's true. Nobody's saying that all land all large landowners are bad. Some do work with their communities, but as we've heard in the debate, this can change on a whim or inheritance alone, and then the balance of power changes. And if we don't have the right balance of power, that can mean that a community is very, very quickly uh, devastated by that change of ownership. We also talked about community ownership, and there's only 500,000 500, acres of community ownership in Scotland and the land fund which many speakers talked about um, has been responsible for some of those community buyouts but as speakers said they have to jump through hoops they have to prove that they are going to act in the public interest they have to have a ballot of the people within the community to make sure that they are happy with this none of this happens when a private land exchange happens and a private buyer takes over. They don't have to fill, fulfill any public interest uh, criteria whatsoever. Andy Whiteman talked about their motion, which uh, their amendment, which we will be supporting, widening um, the definition from community ownership to other kinds of common ownership, like common good and common land. But there's also public ownership, we must remember, um, land owned by the Scottish Government for as the public collectively. And I need to pay tribute to McNeil of Barra, who uh, gifted Barra to the Scottish Government to make sure that it was in public ownership. And I think that's something we need to remember, that not all private landowners are acting in their own interest. We, some people talked about transparency and I look, very, I look forward to the government bringing forward subordinate legislation required to look at transparency and I very hope, much hope they will look at um, ownership from, uh, from abroad as well as at home to make sure that that is transparent as well because we need to know who owns the land um, that we are living on. There wasn't much mention of crofting in the debate, but I'm going to maybe use some of my time just to quickly mention... Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Well, crofters have a right to buy, and it goes a long way to fulfilling the balance of power between them and the landowner. However, it's not easy to use, and I would ask the government to look at simplifying this as part of the new crofting legislation coming forward. And Thank I'm you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, now call Maurice Golden to close for the Conservatives. Eight minutes, please, Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. There is much in the land reform programme that the Scottish Conservatives can agree with, uh, especially given that some of the Scottish Government's current position is drawn from the UK Government's 2011 Localism Act. Now, Finlay Carson and Edward Mountain have already affirmed that broad support for issues such as community empowerment and greater transparency, but they've also identified concerns and risks by the current approach from the Scottish Land Commission. John Scott also flagged that the Scottish Government are one of the biggest landowners in Scotland, accounting for almost one million hectares. Indeed, the Forestry Commission uh, 
have uh, 630,600 hectares under their control. Uh, others, such as the National Trust for Scotland, have 76,000 hectares that they are responsible for. The Cabinet Secretary recognised the importance of land to the people of Scotland. That's something that I can very much agree with, whether it be for housing, for food production, for protecting and enhancing our natural environment, or indeed to tackle climate change. The use of land is very important and I can also agree that we should expect good practice no matter who owns the land. Uh, Claudia Beamish's speech was uh, a rather uh, concerning contribution in that she really isolated landowners uh, and appeared to treat them with uh, disregard and she also uh, went on to advocate that the state was able to redistribute property from legal owners to communities. And I think this is a, a, a concern if that is indeed the Labour position. Uh, Andy Whiteman articulated a well thought out and considered argument for common ownership. And one point that I could agree with him on is that land reform is difficult. Indeed, it is. Um, Liam MacArthur, uh, advocated for pressing ahead the need for increased transparency and indeed more clarity and that is something that I can agree uh, with uh, Mr MacArthur on as well. Now I wanted to highlight a particular concern that people raise with me whenever land report, re reform comes up and that is there is too much focus on ownership of land rather than how it is in being managed and indeed used. For example, I noted, uh, I noted in yesterday's report from the Scottish Land Commission that they acknowledge the positive impact many landowners have on their communities, welcome recognition, but at the same time, the report talked of a monopoly on land ownership that could harm communities. Of course, we must address cases where outcomes are poor, but I can understand how the majority of landowners following good practice might be worried that a stereotype is being perpetuated, that simply owning a sizable amount of land is inherently wrong and harmful. Andy Whiteman. Andy Whiteman. I thank Mr Gordon for that. I mean, one of the benefits of this report is it very explicitly points out that it's actually power and not scale that matters. So it actually has moved the debate on, and therefore that addresses the point and your concern. Morris Golden, and it's actually up to me to call the member, but thank you for your intervention. <laughs> really? Uh, uh, thank you for that clarification, <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I, I, the issue we have with the report is it appears as if the uh, Scottish Land Commission have started with the end point, then look to provide uh, anecdotal evidence in which to get there. And I think that is a problem. Uh, on these benches, we always support uh, an evidence-based approach, and I think in that report, we clearly have not seen that. Uh, I, I also don't believe that talk of compulsory purchase orders is particularly helpful. Instead, we should look to promote better community engagement. I believe there's a huge opportunity for communities, both rural and urban, to develop and sustain productive use of land around them. We should be careful that we do not operate under the assumption that community buyouts should be the default option. That misses the fact that there are other models that can be a better fit in some circumstances, for example, leasing. We have seen 88,000 hectares lost in the tenanted sector in just five years, almost 30,000 in 2016 alone. The Central Association of Agricultural Valuers is clear that this SNP government has provided, and I quote, nothing in the land reform package that encourages anybody to let land. The Scottish Conservatives believe that the Scottish land film should be open to accommodate long leases as well. And underpinning all of this is a need for a transparent system fit for the 21st century, but which does not compromise people's right to privacy or indeed their safety. On the latter point, I'm mindful of concerns raised by the likes of NFUS that providing the personal details 
of landowners can leave them vul vulnerable to protests or indeed to direct action. A case in point would be the recent vegan protests directed at English farmers using details of the farms made available through the Food Standards Agency. These protests have seen disruption, damage and distress to animals. And none of us want to see any of that brought to Scotland. Mm -hmm. And it does not need to be because a transparent system does not necessarily require the publication of physical addresses. Would it not be more useful to provide contact details for relevant land managers to ensure a more practical and speedy engagement process? I take the point made by Scottish Government officials to the uh, a Clare Committee that a physical address can provide greater assurance for those looking to engage with a landowner. However, a register based on such an idea falls short. It misses the point that a publicly available address is not necessary for the fundamental purpose of identifying and engaging with a landowner. It limits accessibility by disregarding digital communications. There is support across this chamber for land reform, but our support is conditional on an evidence-based approach being taken, something which the Scottish Land Commission, in my view, have failed to do. Good practice should be rewarded and support for landowners uh, must be considered, not the perpe perpetuation of stereotypes. Communities should be empowered with new options, not locked into a one-size-fits-all approach. Land ownership should be more transparent, but farmers and other landowners should be able to expect their privacy and safety to be protected. I urge this chamber to support the amendment in the name of Edward Mountain. Thank you very much, Mr. Golden. I call Rosanna Cunningham to close the, go the government cabinet secretary till, till, till decision time, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, today's debate has, I think, demonstrated the importance of land. Much has been said about how we might change deeply ingrained patterns of ownership and the benefits uh, that that will bring, about how we enable more people to own land and influence its use and management, about the value of transparency about who owns land and makes decisions about it. Everyone who's spoken in today's debate has at least recognised the role that land has in supporting and promoting Scotland's ambitions. It seems to me that the Chamber is united in its desire to see changes, although clearly we are not uh, necessarily agreeing on the degree uh, of the change uh, or indeed how we should uh, effect that change. Inevitably, much of the debate has circled round or been informed by the Scottish Land Commission's report, which wasn't actually the intention uh, of this debate in the first place. Um, I should say to those who are criticised what the Scottish Land Commission has done, um, the Scottish Land Commission um, has undertaken quite an extensive range of uh, uh, consultations around the country. It, 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 it discusses and goes to communities right across Scotland, urban and rural. Uh, and in respect of this particular uh, report, the conclusions and the recommendations drew on an evidence base which is published by the Commission. And if members wish to see that, uh, they only need to go uh, and, uh, and look for it. So I, I don't think saying that there isn't proper evidence um, is, is, is a fair uh, criticism. Can I, can I say that I think Andy Whiteman and his intervention to Edwin Mountain's contribution neatly dealt with the paradox of opposition to further community ownership? Edward Mountain started by saying that the Tories supported land reform, but I confess I'd struggle to find anything in his opening speech that would convince me that that was actually true. I note that some of the other Conservative interventions were a little more generous, perhaps reflecting uh, uh, a little closer connection uh, with uh, different views in the part of uh, the electorate. Claudia Beamish, um, uh, I should say, uh, uh, made uh, what I've come to expect as her usual uh, uh, generous and courteous uh, intervention. Uh, the government intends to accept the Labour amendment, uh, although some of the proposals that she discussed specifically um, would have significant complex legal 
and ECHR issues, and that was a matter also referred to by Angus MacDonald. And we can't simply wish those away. So while we support the principles of the recommendations, we will have a very great deal more to do to turn them into practical policies. If I return to Andy Whiteman's uh, contribution, I was entertained by his admission that from time to time he indulges in sound bites. Mm -hmm. Heaven forfend that a politician would be so self-indulgent. Uh, regarding the other government legislation he referred to, I think, as he will be aware, none of it emanates from my own portfolio. Uh, um, I, I will, however, uh, um, undertake to discuss uh, with other uh, ministers whether or not the pieces of legislation that he was talking about do afford opportunities at this stage uh, to be expanded into areas that might uh, be encompassed by land reform. But with regard to the Green Amendment, um, can I say that common ownership isn't our policy and I'm unclear what he's trying to achieve by changing the terminology. Had he not replaced the term community ownership with that, I may have viewed his amendment differently, but I'm not minded to support it because of that lack of clarity and that may just be me exercising a typical lawyer's caution. Mr Whiteman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. Um, I, I did attempt to uh, explain that. Uh, common ownership, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, is not the government's policy. I've used the term common ownership because it encapsulates existing common good land, common tees, common grazings. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary is not suggesting we should eliminate them. So the, 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 the point of replacing that language today was to have something a bit more inclusive. So I hope the government might reconsider. I, I refer to the comment I made about this perhaps being about my uh, lawyer's uh, caution. I'm happy to have the separate discussion with Andy Whiteman about that, but at the moment I'm resisting the Green uh, Amendment. Um, Liam MacArthur and Claudia Beamish reminded us of the 2003 Act, as I had done in my opening remarks. Indeed, I was the SNP spokesperson at the time uh, and recall the SNP arguing then that it didn't go far enough. Uh, which goes some way towards explaining why we have and will continue to pursue this agenda. Um, Liam MacArthur also touched on the feeling at the time that this was a reform well overdue. Uh, and having spent six years in the House of Commons, I can confirm, in my view, that if we'd had to rely on them making any change, we'd still likely be waiting. Gillian Martin rehearsed some of the specific injustices still being experienced described in the Land Commission's report. And with respect to everybody, those uh, uh, um, bits of evidence cannot simply be swept away uh, as if they were not relevant to this debate. Finlay uh, Carson, uh, I wanted to respond to him briefly on the core path issue that he raised, which is a very specific issue. The Local Access Forum is the best route to resolving that issue if he hasn't made contact with them, although ultimately it is Dumfries and Galloway Council that has discretion and powers to amend the core paths plan, but I will write to the member with a more expanded response than that. Alec Rowley was highlighting uh, there was no obligation to use land in the public interest. Uh, uh, that's a fair point he made. He also raised the issue of land value tax. In fact, the government has asked the commission to explore options for a land value tax as well as land value capture. Kenny Gibson reminds us that we don't have to travel to the Northern Highlands to find examples of problems. Just a moment, to Cabinet Secretary. The usual, please sit down. The usual members coming in, please let the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary be heard. There are members in the debate to want to hear it. And I don't think it's a good idea to stand with your back to the chair for too long. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, as I was indicating, we don't have to travel to the Northern Highlands to find examples of problems connected to land ownership. Um, John uh, Scott talked about the failure of NGOs as landowners, but I've always been very clear that with ownership comes not just rights, but also responsibilities, regardless of who is a landowner. And I've not been afraid to say it directly to NGOs and indeed to community landowners as well. Once you, be, you move into the capacity of owning land, then you inherit those responsibilities as well uh, as rights. The subject of land is complex. It's central to the kind of country we want to be, our economy and environment. But we must remember that it is more than that, more than just a resource to which we attach a particular financial value. Land is often spoken about in terms of its cost or its value when it is bought or sold or the return it provides each year. As important as all of this is, perhaps the true value of land is much more fundamental than that. I've often said in the context of land reform that it is a resource for everyone. 
We should recognise that land is more than simply a resource, however. It is the ground on which we stand, on which we work and on which we live. From when we are born until the end of our days, it is our world. It has historical, romantic and symbolic meanings that we should bear in mind even as we talk about the undoubted economic importance of land. When we talk about our aspirations for land, we also talk about our aspirations for ourselves. This mixture of the tangible and the intangible is one reason why issues about land are so emotive and often very complex. Land is not just a commodity, but a human right, essential to a meaningful existence, just as true home is more than only a place to eat, sleep, and take shelter. And I have to say, in my efforts in my time in the House of Commons, which is some considerable number of years ago now, um, I recall the bemusement with which expressions such as that were received by those who simply did not get it, could not understand why land reform was such an emotive and important issue for Scotland. And I shared the feelings about that with Labour members in, uh, Scottish Labour members in the House of Commons, as well as Liberal Democrat members and uh, SNP members. We understood that at a very visceral level in a way which our colleagues south of the border simply did not, and I believe to this day, do not get. And I think that's important for us to remember that this parliament has to be the expression of that very singular and particular understanding of the idea of land that is so Scottish. It does mark us. It does make us different. It makes us stand apart. And for those in the developing world, it is an interesting conundrum when they come across the, the fact that land reform is such a fundamentally important issue for what they see as a country in the developed world. And it opens up a door for us to have a conversation in a way that I believe is unlike any other in any other part of the developed world. So I think it's important that we in this parliament continue to express the strength of that. Land reform begins with this ethical consideration that all of us have this right and we must use land wisely and fairly. Presiding officer. Thank you. That concludes this afternoon's debate and we're going to move straight on to decision time. I would remind members that if the, amend if the amendment in the name of Edward Mountain is agreed, then the amendment in the name of Claudia Beamish and Andy Whiteman will fall. The first question is that amendment 16445.1 in the name of Edward Mountain, which seeks to amend the motion 16445 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham on land reform in Scotland, delivering for now and the future, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16445.1 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 27, no, 87. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore not, the amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that amendment 16445.3 in the name of Claudia Beamish, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of the minister, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division again and members may cast their votes now. <laughs> 
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 16445.3 in the name of Claudia Beamish is yes, 83, no, 32. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 16445.2 in the name of Andy Whiteman, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 16445.2 in the name of Andy Whiteman is yes, 32, no, 83. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the final question is that Motion 16445 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham as amended on land reform in Scotland be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We we'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 16445 in the name of Rosanna Cunningham as amended is yes, 83, no, 32. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting.